mid-1990s is when the U.S. government declassified their remote viewing project. I was in the military unit for remote viewing. What I do know is the Soviets have remote viewers. U.S. Intelligence and Security Command recruited psychic spying. So I taught my platoon to be totally stealthy. The top secret task force implemented in Vietnam, known as the 1st Earth Battalion. Then I began to milk out all their paranormal skills. Is there a secret paranormal psychic war between the United States, Russia, and China? The issue of whether other countries like China would be using this to gather intellectual information from us and other countries um, is a real possibility. The downfalls of a secret spy program. General Stobobon, he took me into the commander's office, got up in my face scowling. Did you kill my computers with your mind? The real men behind the men who stare at goats. We're being taught to believe there's fear, dangerous people, and it's all designed to, for us to get off our asses. What are the implications if our governments have no secrets to hide? Imagine a world where there's no need for secrets. That would be a true paradigm shift. In this special presentation, we'll be speaking with the top remote viewers in regards to the origin of remote viewing, where it is today, and what the future holds. The secret spy program, the men who weren't even there. The First Earth Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Channing, created the Evolutionary Tactics Field Manual. Its goal was a non-lethal and peaceful solutions to potentially change the shape of war as we know it and save lives in the process. He was known for his ability to imagine and illustrate the future battlefield and its advanced applications. Tannen is portrayed by actor Jeff Bridges in his role as character Bill DeJango. How accurate really was the film The Men Who Stare at Goats? Was the 1st Battalion a secret paranormal force in the U.S. military? Is Jim Channing still working for the U.S. military or the CIA? These are some of the questions I wanted to find out. My name is Blake Cousins. I run a large YouTube channel in regards to the UFO and alien phenomenon. I consider myself a distributor of information to the public. With over eight years of research into military programs, it's when I found out that Jim Channon lives on the Big Island of Hawaii. That's where I live. I decided to try and meet the man himself. I got the word. I had three hours to meet with Jim at his dwelling, located just 45 miles from where I live. So I called my production team, along with my twin brother Brent, and headed to the Kohala Coast, destination Artesia. Now I finally get the chance to meet the man himself, Jim Channing. I had many questions that I wanted to ask, so we got to it right away. So a couple of things happened along the way. One of them is I wrote Evolutionary Tactics, a field manual to bring out all the unknown intelligences and in soldiers. And it was coming out at the time of the whole Earth catalog, which you could pass through. And the army officers were passing through this Evolutionary Tactics manual. So here we bre I break in a little bit to a myth mythology format. And beside that, for instance, I wake up one day and the phone rings and they say, Mr. Channon, we want to make a movie about your field manual. And uh, it's called Men Who Stare at Goats. And after I saw the script, and because I had worked in Hollywood before, I know these guys can't make a movie that's all straight. So I'm going to have to tolerate, you know, 50% sight gags, in, you know, <laughs> And the rest of it. Jeff Bridges is gonna play me. <laughs> Hell fucking Lulia. We have to dream a new America that no longer has an exploitative. The Men Who Stare at Goats was inspired by John Ronson's nonfiction bestseller, 
The new Earth Army is changing the way wars are fought. A legion of warrior monks with unparalleled psychic powers can read the enemy's thoughts, pass through solid walls, and even kill a goat by simply staring at it? In this quirky, dark comedy inspired by real life story, you can hardly believe it's actually true. I wanted to get down to the bottom of what the true Jim Channon is all about and the role by Jeff Bridges, Bill Django. Jim insisted on giving me a tour of Artesia, which is a mini eco-village dotted with a few exotic small so have, buildings. In the amphitheater, we have 20 feet of topsoil, so you're able to go down and create this beautiful Jim also practices what he preaches, aiming for full sustainability and implementing permaculture, biodynamic gardening, ancient land practices, and social architecture to make the land not only self-sustaining, so but a heavenly experience. We come out of this uh, amphitheater with sort of microculture, small plants, lots of rocks, the way the Hawaiians used to Jim's do. Jim's first year as Lieutenant Colonel in Vietnam, he Here began to I flesh out the early beginnings of the 1st Earth Battalion and its clairvoyant applications on Going the battlefield. The army, I see what happens in an emotional situation in a completely conflicted set of ethics and at the same time I'm learning to sit in a, a deep forest for most of the time. So I became fundamentally welded to nature there and then welded to the way we had to move through the jungle to find these so-called Viet Cong and search and destroy them. At the same time so I taught my platoon to be totally stealthy. Then I began to milk out all their paranormal skills. And I had a whole set of sentient intelligences working with me. So I came home a year later with all but one of my guys and we never had to kill an innocent villager. When did the psychic phenomenon known as remote viewing begin? And who started it? The late Ingo Swan was a claimed psychic artist and author for being the co-creator of remote viewing and specifically the Stargate Project. The Stargate Project was the code name for a secret army unit established in 1978 at Fort Meade, Maryland by the Defense Intelligence Agency to investigate the potential for the psychic phenomenon in the military and domestic intelligence applications. Swan helped develop the process of remote viewing at the Stanford Research Institute, experiments that caught the attention of the Central Intelligence Agency, which was developed and tested with CIA funding. He is commonly credited with proposing the idea of controlled remote viewing, a process in which viewers would view a location given nothing but its geographical coordinates. For the past 30 years, the United States government has secretly trained a select corps of military personnel in the art of remote viewing. The psychic ability to perceive the thoughts of experiences of the others through the power of the human mind. Now, Lynn Buchanan, a world-renowned expert on remote viewing and its potential, he resides in Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. He was assigned nearly a decade to a clandestine U.S. Army intelligence group. Buchanan trained military personnel who utilizes the inherent psychic abilities as a data collection tool during the Iran hostage crisis and the Chernobyl disaster, including the Gulf War. Back in uh, the early 80s, I was a sergeant first class in the Army working for the intelligence command. I was in Augsburg, Germany, and an incident happened, parts of which are still classified, so I don't usually talk about it. It cost the U.S. government millions in, in computers. Commanding General Bert Stubblebein of the U.S. Intelligence and Security Command came and got me, took me back to D.C., and wanted to form a unit that would do the same to enemy computers. General Bert Stubblebein has an impressive career, including being credited with the redesigning of the intelligence structure of the entire U.S. Army. This was apparently somehow accomplished without the man ever becoming aware of a 25-year-old CIA mind control effort that exploits thousands of unlisted personnel at locations, including the Army's Edgewood Arsenal. Stubblebein claims he was never into the mind operations program. However, he now believes mind control projects continued after the Congress ordered them halted in the 1970s. Congress said that 
smote of mind control and they wouldn't do it because they had been caught in the 60s doing mind control on U.S. citizens. They really didn't want to have anything to do with anything like it again. He took me out to Fort Meade to this unit that had been doing something called controlled remote viewing. Uh, I had never heard of that before. Uh, didn't know what it was, but he just put me in that unit and said, here, you're going to learn to be a psychic. And um, you know, in the military, a general tells you that, yes, sir, I'll do it. I was in the military unit for remote viewing for the rest of my military career, which is very unusual because, you know, soldiers get moved. But I was there for the rest of my career and wound up being the trainer for the unit. Because it was a black unit that didn't exist, I officially didn't exist, and so I had to give up all rights to promotions and everything else, but uh, it was worth it. Oh, it was fantastic. It's the most interesting job I've ever had. So I meet up in Woodland Hills to meet Marty Rosenblatt, one of the co-founders of the Applied Precognition Project. Since the methods of remote viewing were made available to the public, advances in techniques and technology have made dramatic improvements in accuracy. Utilizing his background in physics, understanding the role of precognition and empathy. He explains the role of consciousness and how humanity's collective mind can communicate across time. I first learned about remote viewing using that name in an article that was published in the IEEE in the early 1970s. At that time, I had security clearances. I was working for a private company doing contract work predicting nuclear weapon effects, but that gave me contacts with the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Defense Intelligence Agency, I went and showed them this, um, and they sent me to Stanford Research Institute where I met Hal Pudoff and Russell Targ, um, and their work was incredible. The first time I had ever seen scientific work on psychic phenomenon, like remote viewing. Hundreds of remote viewing experiments were carried out at the Stanford Research Institute from 1972 to 1986. Physicist Russell Targ was a co-founder of the secret CIA-funded program into the investigation of psychic abilities. Hal Pudoff directed the CIA program and collaborated with Russell. Both Hal and Russell captured in this 1974 photo with retired police commissioner Pat Price and CIA contractor monitor Christopher Green. Both Hal and Russell were utterly convinced of the reality of psychic abilities. They learned the accuracy of reliability of remote viewing was not in any way affected by distance, size, or electromagnetic shielding, and discovered the more exciting of the demand and task, the more likely they were successful. One of the main targets of the operation was the Kremlin. Yeah, the military got involved officially in like the 1970s, largely because the Soviet Union was involved. We were somewhat um, concerned at that time about with the Cold War and all that. What was going on? Was this real? And in fact, there was a guy, Skip Atwater, in Fort Meade, and he was directed to start a unit to look into this and they started bringing in remote viewers from the military, and that lasted for like 20 years. Skip Atwater was the operations and training officer for the secret remote viewing program. He recruited and trained an elite group of professional intelligence officers to do remote viewing for the Department of Defense and various members of the national intelligence community. He initiated the U.S. Army's remote viewing intelligence program, now known to the world by the code name Stargate. How did I know I had the capability of remote viewing? I didn't. Uh, General Stobobine stuck me in this unit and uh, they were doing all of this remote viewing work. And I watched them and they um, trained me in it. But for the first months or so I was there, I thought there's a gimmick going on. There's something, they can't really do this. And uh, finally, after they had taught me all of the steps, for how to do it, they started handing me pictures that were sealed in envelopes and saying, without opening the envelope, describe the picture. And I thought, that's crazy, you know? 
And uh, of course, there was no way I could do that. But I followed the steps that they had taught me and opened the envelope and I had described the picture. And all of a sudden, well, I knew I hadn't cheated. And all of a sudden I thought, <laughs> maybe this works. And I took to it like a duck to water. And I was extremely happy to spend the next eight and a half years in that one military unit doing that. Uh, fantastic job. How did the 1st Earth Battalion materialize? Where did the people come from? Well, we started as a, a think tank, but once we popped the 1st Earth Battalion with the field manual, the, the country went berserk, and all these really talented, creative people came to our meetings. So that was the battalion. It wasn't soldiers that were acting in a new way. We didn't get, we hadn't gotten that far. But at that point, the whole army went on a mission to collect extra sensory abilities. It was a reasonably large program, put about $20 million of the U.S. government's funds into the remote viewing project. In fact, one with Joe McMonagle, he was asked to get information about a facility that was hidden. It was in a mountain in the Soviet Union. Well, Joe said they're building this huge submarine, much bigger than anything that anybody had, including the um, Soviets, of course. And at first, the CIA thought that was crazy. Um, they weren't even that close to water. He even predicted when it was going to be launched using remote viewing. Well, it turned out a few days, either before or after, it wasn't exactly on, but pretty darn close, they dug a trench and put out the biggest submarine that had ever been launched. And that information came first through remote viewing. Remote viewing kind of shows the ultimate connectivity in our world. We're all connected. When we accept the reality of the capabilities of consciousness, which include remote viewing, include precognition, include the ability to influence matter at a distance, that we will be much better for it because the universe works that way. Science has in fact proven remote viewing. It's proven precognition using all scientific techniques. Guess what? Most scientists still won't believe it because it is so different which is what makes it a paradigm shift. So you're saying right now that there's people within the military that could remote view into sensitive military factions from other governments? Yes. But what's, what's not normally known is that you imagine one person has got this amazing ability to project themselves somewhere into the enemy territory, read the general's battle plan, and come back. Twelve people do way better than one person and they do it by layers, and it's a real protocol. Some, one of the layers is sort of uh, emotional. One of the layers is shape. One of the layers is color. And they go after these as a group, and then they have a great filtering process in order to finally pop out what they believe to be true. As far as what the government is doing now, I sincerely hope that they still have a project going. When you retire uh, from a classified unit, they quit telling you things. And so I don't know, uh, but it would be really dumb of the government not to have an ongoing project like this. The issue of whether other countries like China, um, but any country would be using this to gather intellectual information from us and other countries um, is a real possibility. Uh, it's hard to imagine that some countries would not do this. The kind of ethics involved when you see somebody else as your enemy and possibly doing the same to you, and we certainly know that there's a lot of cyber um, espionage, if you will, going on, um, I, I would have to think, and I haven't been thinking much about this, but now that you asked the question, I'd have to think that that is going on. Now, how successful are they at it? I don't know. And I hope just like we have 
counter cyber, right, to go to stop hackers. I hope our government is, in fact, coming up with techniques to, to protect our information because we're not through the paradigm shift yet where there are no secrets. As far as destroying the enemy computers, um, it was a great plan and General Stubblebein uh, was all set up to form a unit to do this and it would have worked. Uh, the Russians were doing the same kind of research and they were having success at it. We could have had success at it too, but Congress said, no, that smites of mind control and we're not gonna fund that because that's political death you know, to any politician. And so they wouldn't fund it. And because they wouldn't fund it, it, it was a matter of money. In Washington, D.C., there are always two answers to any question you can ask. One is politics, the other is money. Uh, the politics and the money were both against such a unit, so it didn't happen. Human nature is gonna have to change because we do have some evil people out there. I have this faith, and there's some things you just can't prove. The good, once we accept that consciousness, that our own abilities are so incredibly powerful that there's no need for evil. The evil that we see, and it looks like evil, it is evil, perhaps can only be understood in this bigger concept um, of the ultimate good. As intellectual property and nuclear weapons become more dependent on computers, the vulnerability of governments to protect oneself becomes apparent. The CIA's mission was to apply psychic super soldiers to penetrate the enemy's electric grid, control networks, and the missile navigation data at one point, Lynn Buchanan and General Stubblebine realized that this power is very real. I've always, since childhood, I was one of those um, poltergeist kids, you know, that I get angry, things fall off shelves and all that. Well, I had written a computer program for the computer systems, and I was to give a demonstration of the computer program. This other sergeant who had wanted that job and didn't get it, I was picked over him, came in while I was in combing my hair and making sure that there were no wrinkles in my uniform for the presentation, he came in and did something. And when I gave the presentation in front of all these generals from all these different NATO countries, I gave my little song and dance and then I hit the enter key to start the program and demonstrate it. And the computer went out. It cost the government, I hear, an estimated $500 million to replace computers, to replace systems and electronic systems and all that. General Stubblebine, of course, being the head of the Intelligence and Security Command, got wind of this. He took me into the commander's office, got up in my face scowling. Did you kill my computers with your mind? I just sort of heard myself say, yes, sir, I did. And this grin came across his face and he said, far effing out, have I ever got a job for you? You can't deny that their remote viewers can pick up information from the future. So precognitive remote viewing is a reality as well. Uh, it's an intelligence collection effort. We're teaching it to police departments to find missing children, to find missing evidence, and so forth. And it's very quietly being used for businesses. We've done projects for moon exploration, research and development of, uh, of electronics uh, for development of businesses and, and so on. Is remote viewing paranormal? First of all, I hate that word because remote viewing is real, like many other psychic phenomena, Te telepathy, precognition, all of those are real. Um, capabilities, natural capabilities of, of human beings, so I don't like that term. I also believe it is indeed spiritual. It is getting to the very essence of what consciousness can do. And this thing we call consciousness, which is right now on the forefront of science in terms of trying to be understood, 
Uh, in fact, I believe consciousness is the fundamental. You're not going to get a scientific theory which can explain consciousness because consciousness is at the very fundamental nature of reality. A lot of soldiers who are home with their families now, and they'll never know that the information that we provided kept them from be being, being killed. The um, ups are when we had success. The downs were mostly when we had success in the remote viewing and nobody would pay attention and because of that, nothing happened. One of the sessions I had done was Qaddafi. They were going to raid Qaddafi and try to kill Qaddafi. Air and naval forces of the United States launched a series of strikes against the headquarters, terrorist facilities, and military assets that support Muammar Gaddafi's subversive activity. 1986, United States bombing of Libya, codenamed Operation El Dorado Canyon. In Libya, there were over 40 casualties and one U.S. plane was shot down. Due to the lack of the military abilities to promptly pursue Lim Buchanan's predictions, could have perhaps prevented worldwide catastrophes. I predicted the Chernobyl meltdown three days before it happened, and I told them it was going to happen. Uh, described it, described the way it did happen, and uh, nothing was done about it. When Saddam Hussein pulled out of Kuwait, I said, you've got to drive him to the west and then north, because if you drive him to the north, he's going to light set fire to all these uh, wells. And they said, oh, he wouldn't do that. Well, they drove him north, and he did. The applications of remote viewing go far beyond the battlefield. Are the remote viewers of today reaching out to a universal consciousness far beyond our Earth? Every thought that any sentient being, any person, any animal, anybody, anything that has consciousness here on Earth, anywhere in the universe, ETs, are all collected in this universe of collective consciousness. And what seems to be the reality is each of us has access to that entire UCC, Universal Collective Consciousness. We can go into it to get information from the future. In fact, that's one of the most valuable things about precognition. It shows that we can get information from the future that blows the normal concepts of time. We live in a universe which is really integrated into a oneness through this universe of collective consciousness. Do you think that uh the world's ready for alien visitation on a massive scale in front of the public eye? I think it's going to be done like any good movie is going to be done. On page 78 of the script, there's the reversal. And right now we're going through the reversal. We're, be, we're being taught to believe there's fear, dangerous people, and it's all designed to, for us to get off our asses and do something. So it's a perfect drama. Why would they invent a civilization like this on a, on a starship planet with so many dimensions not to have a graduation? And you know what? They don't have to come in a big clunky ship. All they have to do is just appear sitting next to you as they join you in the fifth dimension or you join them in the fifth dimension. Imagine having a kind of people who could live within the crust of a planet, you know? Well, it'd be really nice if they were big and strong and white so they could see each other down there and they had some scales on them so that they wouldn't scratch themselves as they were moving through and they had night vision eyes. So these terrible Dracos are perfect for an inter interterrestrial life where they have and create all the things they need. There's between the top of the surface and say 60 miles down, there's it's honeycomb. And every creature has a place. You know, I mean, if snakes were 30 feet tall and stood on legs, you'd be scared of them too. <laughs> so the trick is for us to wake up to a loving connection so we can all do this thing together. There are ETs, extraterrestrials, out there someplace. The fact that we would be the only ones here in the entire universe that have consciousness. So once you accept that, 
then to assume that we're the people who have had it on this planet for the longest is also ridiculous. I believe there are ETs. I believe there are ETs who are probably millions of years more advanced than us, older than us, that have probably gone through similar stages. Basically, I think they're good. Otherwise, with the technology that they apparently have, why are we still here? If they wanted to destroy us, I would think that they could. And that's one of the reasons I believe that consciousness, the advanced consciousness that I presume they have, because they're thousands of years ahead of where we are, and I believe our next paradigm is going to be where advanced consciousness is the accepted norm. And I think they're there and are probably watching our transition with great interest and probably rooting for us because they know on the other side there is a wonderful new reality, an expanded understanding and really appreciation of the marvelous universe we live in. The important thing here to know is as we think about our future, we should be thinking we're about to be the new neighbor in the solar system. Don't you think we ought to consider what they would like as a new neighbor? What would the, the behavior of the new neighbor be? And so I would say taking care of their planet? Well, I don't know if they're doing such a good job with that. <laughs> My dream and what I'm preparing the Army for is to be at the watersheds with the veterans to set up the starports so that aliens will know where to come. And then they get, uh, the people in the country by the water will get the high-tech energy devices and all those other devices. And uh, I think there's not a chance in hell that they won't melt the whole biosphere down with love, and that's what I think is going on right now. They will use uh, like six days of sweet music coming from we don't know where and I've actually written that landing scenario and so my guides can at least because you know if, if somebody on planet earth doesn't have the consciousness they can't give us the results we have to earn the consciousness before they can uh, operate with it so this would be a series of uh, atmospheric musical temperature shift smells for kind of three days and then certain things would appear I think. And they could appear in the country first, that's good. They could appear at the indigenous tribal places first, that's good. Um, and um, all I can say is they're not going to pull this off without having arranged the biosphere to be the most beautiful, soft, warm, loving container they can possibly make out of it. So it, you're starting to feel it change right now. And if you're not playing with that new feeling, I think you ought to try because you want to get plugged into the spiritual dimension as soon as you can, so you're not you're not panicked. You know, if you see some blue blue person arrive with the newspaper in the, in the morning, <laughs> yeah, no, the universe is not going to all this trouble with not having a great ending, and we're now going through the reversal in the third act where we think. All is lost. No, Oil Can Harry is back out there and he's got Pearl Pierhart on the railroad track and here comes the train. Yeah, and this is the this is a faith test, guys and gals. So open up, get your heart in shape, stay out of here as much as you can, stop talking shit about each other, and don't be afraid of any one group. We're all responsible for the mess we're in and we all have the ability to help us get out of it. Now, think about what consciousness is. Consciousness is sort of a non-physical thing. The difference between the brain and the mind. And consciousness, remote viewing, show that these connections go much deeper than we usually take for granted in terms of what's possible. Remote viewing shows that you can get information from a distant um, and distance includes space and time. You make connections with people in the past, in the future. 
remote viewing kind of shows the, the ultimate connectivity in our world. We're all connected. We're all one. That's spiritual. And consciousness really is the thing which binds us all together. Trees, lots of fruit. About 45% of our food on this land comes from above. The trees do the job. Then we have regular gardens with about 20%, and then we have edible landscaping that just fills in the cracks the whole way around. Altogether, we can feed 15 people, and we have water catchment for 15 people. Uh, so we're ready to go uh, anytime. Yes, we, we love the fact that we support almost all kinds of animal life here, Small, smaller versions, but there's at least six cats. And we have 12 species of birds, and that's one of the aviaries right here that we, we made out of a very sexy uh, new um, dynamic design. And this is a Polish chicken, and uh, he, he, she thinks she's in charge, and she's going to show you how she finds her food. <laughs> <laughs> so here is a Cherokee garden <laughs> that the chief showed us how to make and it's got uh, corn in the middle and, and over here is our tool shop and the tool shop was made by simply taking these kind of pallets from the grocery store knocking off the edge pieces staining them a little bit and making a place like that and that's where we drive our vehicles in for vehicle work. So uh, we have a surplus area and a, what do you call it? A, uh, what kind of shop is that where you just put things, crazy things back together in different ways? What's well, one of those? So like, 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 like most uh, shrines and, and botanical gardens, you gotta have maintenance. <laughs> I was born in Terrytown, New York in 1939. What were your mother and father like? My mother and father were so um, budding upper class, I would say. Dad, a super practical logistician, His, the family came from nuts and bolts. And my mom, super empathic and deaf. Tell me about your family's military history. My family's military history goes back as far as George Washington and maybe to Rome uh, 23 generations ago and Mark Antony. Uh, I have Robert E. Lee as a fourth great grandfather. Um, so the, that side of the tradition was really in the gentleman department. So I'd say they weren't all cunning fighters, um, but they were gentlemen. 1962, I got a degree from the University of Kentucky and a Distinguished Military Graduate uh, Regular Army Commission. And um, off I went to Fort Riley, Kansas to be in the infantry. So first day in combat in Vietnam, 14 things happened. I'd been trained in two of them. I did the two things quite well. But the first thing that shocked me is when I asked my soldiers to shoot somebody they saw down the path. Uh, they did, but they shot all overhead. They're all crack shots. I, I saw them on the, a rifle range with a machine gun at 500 feet, just knocking the head out of it. So, like history shows us, only 30% can eventually be taught to be happy about shooting someone. So it didn't turn out that later, it did turn out later in the war they were counting body count as a measure of a soldier's effectiveness and a leader's effectiveness, and that was, it was totally corrupted at that point. The problem, a uh, dual problem of having my soldiers not being discovered in a killing zone made me train them to be uh, stealthy. Having to find the enemy without them knowing we found them, had to, I had to train them to be sentient, you know, extrasensory. So both of those things carried through my career as I began to teach other leaders. 1978, I was assigned to the Public Affairs Office in Los Angeles to help the film industry get the Army right. 
And when I was there, it turned out that was a time, a season when Hollywood didn't give a damn about getting the army right. If there was Sergeant Bilko, it would have been fine, but nothing more than that. And uh, that upset me, but it was also able to move about in California. So when I was elected to also be a part of this think tank, I had my, I just put my scouting shoes on. And I'm a good illustrator and a good writer, and I wrote that manual by myself at night, one page at a time, and then popped it on the Army. So, after I left the Army, um, I found out <laughs> that they had a name for me. It was called the Lightning Rod. <laughs> and I think it stems from an experience at Fort Knox, where after collecting my material about the uh, all this lovely technology, I said, I, this would be better as a mythology. And so, I, the name was, I was flying to Fort Knox on the plane, I got the word, the first Earth Battalion. It was just delivered to my head. So when I got there, I said, I'm not giving these guys another death by PowerPoint, uh, a pre you know, pitch, uh, giving, giving them the data, you know, this type of tool, that type of tool, bullshit. That was not going to, that's, a, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So I'm standing there and they say, Mr. Colonel, or Major Channon, I was a Major, Major Channon, would you give us your um, uh, report on your trip through these esoteric technologies? And I said, I'm not giving you an information briefing. Join me in the officers club on Wednesday night and I will take you into a ceremony where you will see all these ideas put into real effect so you can feel them. And they just sort of went, no, oh, California hasn't been working on this guy. So sure enough, on Wednesday they come in, I have them take off their shoes, I have the back of the officer's club, all the lights down, some plastic plants in there, a candle on a dollar bill, in the middle of the room and I said, gentlemen, we're about to enter a ceremony. We will give resonance to the field we're in by saying the mantra E for the earth. Ready? And <laughs> they just stumbled their way through it. They were afraid to show their other guys that they were gonna really play this esoteric game, but I just, I nailed him like a, like a platoon sergeant, you know, I said, look, that's not up to standard. This time, take a breath, if you will, before we make this sound. And they did, and it came out, and if you know anything about sound, it unifies the energy field. So then I had Colonel Mike Malone come out and do a black belt karate dance, a kata. Oh, then they went, okay, this is real soldier stuff now. Now we're back into them. Then I told them the story of the dollar bill. And eventually I began to say, you are about to join the 1st Earth Battalion. This is our new world. And I gave them the rationale for that. And then they all kind of sort of quietly walked out. Next day I go into the conference room. I'm standing outside, about to go in. The, as, a, as a guy out there says, uh, he says, Colonel Shannon, you're not to go in. I could hear inside they were going, rrr, 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 rrr. and I thought, oh, I've gone too far this time. And then the doors open, and the guy says, Colonel Channon, report. And I know that sound, so I, I went in and I stood at attention. The room was at attention, and they read me the orders, official orders, and I can show you a copy of them that uh, I'm to be the commander of the. First Earth Battalion to go forward in space and time and dare to think the unthinkable. And that was the pop. And I'm still doing it because I'm still on orders. He's just a great personality. He always was uh, just fun to, to walk. He'll be missed. Um, the movie 
part of it. I personally think that was just too Hollywood. It just didn't take the importance and significance of remote viewing and consciousness in general as seriously as it should have. This is a real important subject. But I think the thing that I will remember him most for was his aggressive work in really wanting to lay out a place where ETs would land to make contact with Earth. I mean, you know, a lot of us more and more coming to just accept that ETs are out there somewhere, but he basically invited them in. <laughs> and, um, and that's remarkable, and I just have great respect for him for doing that in a very open way. I was very sad to hear that Jim Channon had died, and you know, I guess the way he had died would would be the way he would want to die, just to keel over. Uh, I think he was out working in his garden and just keeled over. And um, a lot of people think that Jim Channon was crazy because of the way he acted. Uh, I think crazy like a fox may be a better term. He was an absolute genius, but he was one of those flamboyant geniuses that come along once in a lifetime. I was very lucky to be friends with Jim. Sort of like um, uh, Salvador Dali, you know, was one of those flamboyant geniuses. And uh, uh, Jim had uh, made a presentation in front of a whole room full of generals one time, and he took flowers and gave flowers to each general. Um, he was always doing something flamboyant in such a way that it would pull out the reaction that he wanted from a person. You never knew what he was gonna say, never knew what he was gonna do. But it was always for a purpose, and it was always a good purpose. Jim was one of the greatest people I've ever known. And the fact that he was a flamboyant genius like that and succeeded in the military shows just how much of a genius he was. Fantastic man. When he died, I think one of the brightest bulbs in the Christmas tree of life burned out. It came to a shock to all of us. We miss him dearly. We were deep into the project. Little did I realize the second interview with Jim Channon would be the last time I would see him. He had a lot of things to say that goes far beyond remote viewing. It's spirituality, it's lifestyle. What you're about to see is what makes Jim Channon an endearing figure in the world of remote viewing and beyond. social architect's brain gets to plaster itself all over the walls and whatnot. I've downloaded some of this stuff from dreams and painted it just a dream at a time. I've calculated in some cases a certain set of things in a story. So here's a big compelling piece here and a lot of people ask me, so how do you marry your spiritual intelligence with your architectural drawing and your painting and come up with something. Well, this guy started off as a dream and it only covered this part, but the message was uh, Agartha rising. So you can see this piece rising. And after I put it up, I said, well, if we have the people from inside the planet coming forward, how do we want to greet them? And then on the other side here, we have all the, the exoterrestrials uh, ancestors, I prefer that word, 
coming in, big ships like this, into an area where biospheric recovery is a big part of the deal. And then we have our Earth Battalions down here trained to receive them and team, as a team work uh, together. In the meantime, we see spiritual intelligence growing and growing and growing and uh, eventually this will be a council of all the planetary starships. I, I call our planet a starship. It really is an amazing star. It was made, you know, like all the rest of them. Seeing something about my military her heritage and whatnot, here's a, a set of a medals that both myself and my father won. So this is sort of blood. What about this one right here? It's, it has like a, a Russian symbol. Did it's, you work for the Russian government? No, but my father got a, a Russian medal when the, his division landed on the, the river where they met the Russians. So, hello, they're in the picture too. Which one of these medals are you most proud of? The Bronze Star three times. Uh, doesn't make me a superhero, but it meant I was steady. <laughs> in order to get a Silver Star, you have to sort of lose a lot more soldiers, and I didn't do that. All right, Jim, can you uh, tell us about this soldier here? Yes, this is the first day of combat, first man shot. Got him on a helicopter in four minutes, and uh, but I noticed he needs a little touch-up. So he's your first soldier that you lost on the battlefield? Yes, first and last. You only lost one soldier that was under your command. In 319 days of search and destroy, I lost one soldier, and I never shot a an innocent civilian. So, this is a Balinese version of Rama, who's a Hindu god, but the Balinese know how to do things a little more sweetly, and I know how to make the statue look um, better by highlighting the parts that are a little bit mildewed. But look at that, it pops right out. Okay, Jim, I know the movie was quite controversial, but I want to ask you, why did they not use your name, Jim Channon, and they went with the Django? Uh, Blake, that was my choice. Uh, I only had the first screenplay in my hands, and from what I could tell, uh, we didn't need to incriminate soldiers and officers and scientists who had stuck their neck out this far to be creative by having Hollywood make another sort of, you know, joke out of it. No, enough Sergeant Bilko. At the end of the movie, they portray you as escaping from a military base in Iraq and putting LSD in the food and this was your escape opportunity. Was this real? <laughs> no, they, they just made up, that was sort of any site, Middle East, any army compound Middle East, but it was hilarious. And so it's good. <laughs> yeah, but me, kind of fat, shirt out, sipping things that dribble down my face, uh, acting sort of out of it, not accurate. It kind of made you look like a clutch. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Well, when you get a uh, screenplay from BBC, you know that MI6 probably wrote it. So they didn't want to make me any more famous than necessary. So you believe that the MI6 might be behind discrediting your message, basically, to uh, the army, and uh, now they're discrediting the messenger? Uh, you don't have to study the broadcasting world very long to find out that BBC and MI6 are pretty much the same thing, and they've been in the business of defaming people they, did, they wanted to for a long time. The public needs to know is the Army has no value in going around and spending time killing goats. If you can make somebody go unconscious for two hours, which might have been a real objective, then you can walk into the place you want to walk into, do your business, come out, and they wake up okay. It was a peaceful incursion. That's the idea. Talk 
talking about the super soldier. That was about increasing the capacity of a soldier to survive on the battlefield. That was about strength, ability to carry extra equipment, having a more volatile set of weapons. Paranormal soldiers needed a whole nother set. All right, so super soldiers and paranormal soldiers, they're altogether different. Tell me about the paranormal soldier. The paranormal soldier has more range to discover what's out there. And there are a lot of tools for that. We used to have men in the army who were all hunters. Well, they knew how to judge what they heard. They knew how to feel life force. They knew how to look at the trail. They knew all those sentient skills. But the last generations of soldiers haven't had those. So they are super soldiers because they can get there with their paranormal soldiers so they don't get ambushed. There's been rumors stated that the military is preparing for a major false flag, a fake alien invasion, uh, using possibly holographic imagery to deceive the public. Have you heard anything about this? Should we worry about this? Of course, part of the military, Air Force, Army, are all uh, aware of what might happen if things change. False flags, the government's been doing that consistently for 50 or 100 years. It's so old, they don't even have to defend themselves anymore from it. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that there are alien hybrid beings within our own governments in control of the people? I can't imagine an intelligent galaxy that wouldn't have penetrated all aspects of our local civilization since we are the petri dish. No, we're the experimental culture. And so, oh, every imaginable combination would be found somewhere. Mostly they're good at staying either out of sight underground or modifying their appearance to look like us. I hope they're here. Over six million people report it every year worldwide that they've been abducted by aliens, taken up into spacecraft some people say that these aliens are nothing but manufactured biological creatures made by our own governments to do a false flag of an alien abduction phenomenon. Do you believe that aliens are truly abducting people? Is this real? I believe that the smarter intelligences in the galaxy know that planet Earth is an experiment. So they, and they know everybody's going to live eternally. So. They're coming in to get information about their own genetic improvements. So in some cases that means you put somebody on a table and take their DNA. If it means you cut the rectum out of a cow very carefully to get some genetic material, that's all used for their upgrade. They're just being normal, opportunistic, awake, civilized beings. Yes, they want our uh, genetics as well as our mineral deposits and things that they can't normally get. That's one of the reasons why they're underneath the planet. There's so much going on underneath. Area 51, by the way, is, is a tiny little airport compared to, you know, maybe a thousand miles of underground tunnels, all operating in the honeycomb, soft part of the crust, so they can just wander through. We need a place for the people who are, say, uh, draconian. Oh, there's, if you look at them, they're all white, they, uh, they have scales, they have everything they need to live underground where they've always lived. So we should get used to them as neighbors and figure out how we can cooperate. We have a thousand cultures on this planet, we have many genotypes and phenotypes, animals, and we're under pressure to learn how to get along. We provide that library to the people in the galaxy and some other materials that are available to that aren't available to them and we will be accepted that's our best defense strategy go planet imagine a world where this was taken for granted that's what i see is our next paradigm the next big paradigm shift is going to be a consciousness paradigm shift where things like remote viewing, telepathy, 
um, maybe even psychokinesis are taken for granted. It's a step-by-step-by-step -step -step process. Back when they started giving me pictures and envelopes, there's no way I could have told you what was in those envelopes, but I followed the steps they had taught me, and it worked. Accepted within society, it'll be a positive aspect of society. But with this comes the idea that there may be no secrets. If you can remote view things which we would normally think would be hidden, well, maybe you get to a place where there are no secrets. Imagine a world where there's no need for secrets. That would be a true paradigm shift. I'm Jim Channon. Call myself a social architect. One of the things social architects do is they design uh, spaces so that people can have a bigger sense of life, life force, actually an experience. There is data, then information, then knowledge, then wisdom, then experience, then maybe rapture, where we're looking at the highly charged experience you can get when you bring a group of people together in full play. And if it's colorful, you'll pay attention to it. And if it has music behind it, it'll be even better. So I've helped people make up stories about their organizations and tried to take them to another level. I never asked people in corporations what their higher purpose was that they didn't go, Jack, what is our higher purpose? John, we're going to be out here at 1600 night. We got two hours to figure this out. Get on it. No, they never says, you can't ask us that. That's a cultural question. No, they just don't know much about culture. So here we are, a connected civilization, looking for something as big as what we did in the last century, which was to connect the planet. And that something is to go for paradise. <laughs>